truce of running for running mothers or busy women. Um, uh, I have a co-author in Portland. Uh, her name is Sarah Bowen Shea, so she's obviously not here. I'm up here in Boulder. Um, and about three years ago, uh, we wrote a book called Run Like a Mother. And um, what we wanted to do with Run Like a Mother was fill um, a hole that we saw in running books. Not that we don't enjoy lots of running books and tons of advice, but the books that were all out there were kind of dry and a little clinical about, you know, run this fast and go this hard and then foam roll and then you can call yourself a runner. And, and we realized, like, there are a lot of women that run for the time on the clock and the miles and we, runners love our numbers, but there's also so many other reasons why we run. We run for sanity. <laughs> we run to listen to our own music or our own podcast, you know, get away from the wiggles or whatever it happens to be. Um, we run to hang out with our girlfriends. I mean, I call my runs my happiest hour now, and it happens at 5.30 in the morning instead of 5.30 p.m. at night, right? You don't have the time to go sit and have a glass of wine anymore, but you can, you know, download your day first thing in the morning and uh, with a good friend. Um, we run to take care of ourselves and just to have some time. And so we wanted to write some books. Um, so Run Like a Mother came out in 2010. Train Like a Mother came out in 2012. And they're both kind of written in kind of chatty, easy, um, accessible ways that kind of full of humor and wit, um, but still have a lot of good advice. So that's kind of what this talk is going to be about. It's not, even though I'm at Training Peaks in Boulder, where you know everyone has the body fat of a Diet Coke and is super, super serious, um, we're actually uh, um, just going to kind of play it fun and kind of take a wide view of, of running. Um, so, uh, so the first thing, and this is super basic, but I think it bears repeating, is that running is never easy. It is not easy. It will never be easy. And, um, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, you know, you go for a run and um, you come back and you are a more patient person, a patient mother or father, you are a more loving spouse, you are a more efficient worker, like you're just kind of all better, right? It just kind of makes everything feel good again and you kind of feel balanced and ready to take on the world with some energy and some vigor. Um, but the, the cost of getting that lovely feeling and that lovely high is that you have to do something that isn't easy. <laughs> it's worth it, but it's not easy. And I, so I think, you know, sometimes, and I mean, Sarah and I um, collectively have been running for more than 50, or about 50 years, which is kind of both impressive and depressing at the same time, right? Um, but um, we realized, like, that, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, we realized that, you know, we've never been on an easy run. There are runs that are easier. Or, but there's never a run where you come back and one's like, oh, that was a piece of cake, effortless. Like, I could do that all day long. It's always going to take effort to put yourself, move your body weight forward, you know, put a pretty uh, significant cardiovascular load on your heart and lungs. I mean, it's tough. So you just kind of buy into that a little bit, kind of accept that, you know, um, and just realize that. And realize that, you know, running my eight on a scale of one to ten of hardness um, probably feels similar to Kara Goucher's. <laughs> she may be running five minutes or more faster than me per mile, but we're both kind of in that red line zone that really hurts, and it's uncomfortable to stay there. And so if you can just kind of say, like, even though they're going faster, they make it look easier. They're probably, there's some part of them that really hurts, and they're doubting it, and they want to quit. It just kind of validates where you are a little bit, too. If you can kind of like accept that it's going to hurt and then just kind of realize that maybe nobody talks about it. I mean, I'll talk about it freely. I just um, finished an Iron Man a month ago, and the first five miles, like, oh my gosh, if someone would, would have said, can you quit right now? I'd be like, yeah, yeah, can you give me a ride? Like, I'm done. I did not want to do it. And, and everybody, you know, in their really sleek little tri suits just ripping by me. And I just, I mean, I was walking, and I had a hard time walking, and I just felt like, oh my gosh, how are they doing it? It looks so easy for them. How are they doing that? And I am just struggling, struggling, struggling. And, you know, you give yourself a little time, and you can come back in the race, and all of a sudden, everyone that was ripping by me um, was struggling, you know, 20 miles later. I, I was still struggling, too. But, you know, but the reality is, is, you know, appearances can lie, you know, and you can make anybody feel better in your mind than you feel internally. So if you can kind of realize that it's going to hurt for everyone, we'll be in a much better place. That's the first truth. Um, the second truth is that there is a good and a good enough. And you have to really respect the difference between the two. Um, before I had kids, you know, you had this, like, lovely time where you've got, you know, 24 hours, like, yawning in front of you. And you've got, you know, brunch and maybe a short run and then a movie and then out to dinner. And then, you know, oh, I was going to run at 6 this morning, but I'll just run at 8.30 instead. That's not a big deal, right? Um, 
And, uh, and, and, and we type A runners, which most of us are type A, um, it always has to be good. Like good enough for me before I had kids was not enough. Like it had to be an A effort or I was gonna go back and do it again, right? Now, you know, two kids later and you know, where my life is, is not compartmentalized anymore and everything just kind of jumbles together, you realize that like 80% or even 75, a C effort is good enough most days. And that is a bar that um, I encourage you to try and clear. Um, so a good enough run one day might be, oh my gosh, I had a fight with my partner last night, I didn't sleep well, um, I'm still gonna get up and go. Um, it might be my kid was up barfing, it might be, you know, I just haven't gone in five days and I just, I just really, really, really don't wanna go. You go out for three miles and you come back, good enough. Um, you're going out for your first double digit run, 10 miles, um, and you get to mile eight and you're like, I'm gonna puke, I wanna quit, I don't wanna do this anymore, and you start on a run walk interval thing. Good enough, you get to 10, you know? Running is kind of this, you can never know when the lightning bolt is gonna strike when you have a really good run, right? Sometimes it comes out, you're like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Like you wake up with the blahs and the grogginess and you're like, fine, I'll just go, I'll just go. And, you, and 10 minutes later, you just feel like a rock star, right? That, it comes on randomly on July 7th at 5.47 a.m. when you weren't expecting it, you know? So those good runs, absolutely, like eat them up, love them, live for them. But don't be disappointed if you just have a good enough run. I mean, that is all good enough. Um, similarly, I feel like uh, there's a grace period um, where you're good enough is great. Um, and that's, we have a lot of women that come to us that have just had a kid and they're all, they want their bodies back. They want their lives back. And, and we absolutely understand that. Um, but the reality is, is you've got to be kind to yourself. I mean, when everybody, whenever anybody asks me for advice after having a kid, I just say, be kind to yourself. Like, give yourself a grace period. Give yourself a year where any time you go, it's not good enough. It's great. Like, literally a year. And I, and I mean that with all honesty. Um, you know, you can absolutely set goals during that year, but, you know, if you PR, great. If you end up being able to take on a half marathon, I've never done that before, great. But that's not necessarily what you need to do. You just need to get out and get your yayas out and get, you know, go for your runs. Um, you get a six month grace period at other times in your life. This is really scientific. Um, so, um, so, you know, you're moving. You just started a new job. Um, you just got a divorce. You just got married. You just had uh, lost a loved one. Anything that kind of really, really rocks your boat, you know, is not the time to say, okay, now I'm gonna go out and rip it up. Um, I just think that that's too much stress on your life. I mean, you know, it's just a lot to carry. So again, during those times, good enough is great. And then, you know, mark your little grace period off on your calendar and then, and then get going. Um, so, um, and then this will be my last kind of negative tip, I promise. But, um, but uh, I, I don't necessarily associate the word joy with running. Like, I'm never in the middle of a run, I'd be like, oh, this is just joyful. Like, it is always hard, like I said, but I always feel joy after a run. I always love how I feel afterwards. Again, that energy, the positive, the patience, the loving, all that stuff that comes on when I, I mean, I walk in the door, you know, and, and I feel like Bruce Springsteen, like a rock star, like nothing can go wrong. Um, so that's after a run, it's not during a run. Um, so it's not really joy, but I also don't want it to be dread. Um, because if it turns into something that you just dread, whether you're pushing yourself too hard, going for a goal that isn't appropriate for you at that time, where you are fitness-wise or life-wise, if you are um, maybe going too long or running through injury and you're just thinking, you're just kind of wishing it all away, but you, you, know, you really are dreading it, um, that's not good either. Like, I think trying to find that balance in between. Um, one thing that helps me kind of stay in my run and, um, and kind of find that balance again, that nice neutral, okay, this isn't like, wow, the most amazing thing, but it's not, I'm not ready to hang it up quite yet. Um, it's just trying to really live in the moment. Um, and uh, one thing that I do, I have a mantra that I've talked about a little bit on our website, but is I am here now. And with each footstep, I am here now. I am here now. And I'm not worrying about if I'm in a race and I'm at mile three, I'm not worrying about the hill at mile 10. If I'm running, I mean, I've got a lady here in the audience who is doing Ironman Tahoe. And, uh, you know, that's the, that's the thing about Ironman is they say, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So you concentrate on that one bite. Where are you now? I'm in this one mile. And when I get to the next mile, I'll think about that. Um, 
And so that kind of helps bring you in the moment and find this nice kind of balanced, peaceful calm. Um, the next way that I feel like is a good way to kind of bring out, um, enhance your running is to run naked. And I, I don't mean, uh, you know, showing all your stretch marks and, you know, you're really uh, perky chest, not so much anymore, right? Um, is, um, but running naked without your gadgets. You know, no GPS, no Garmin, no music. And if that idea, like, has you, like, you know, climbing the walls, like, are you kidding me? No way. You're the first person that should do it, <laughs> okay? Um, because, you know, the thing about running is that, um, yes, it's great to kind of tune out and let your mind wander and stuff, but it's also great to tune in. Um, and all this stuff, you know, how fast did I go? Or, oh my gosh, I love this song. You know, it, it takes away from the physical effort that you are doing. And, uh, and so I am a very injury prone runner. I've had, I, you know, I run a race and then I basically have to take a whole bunch of time off because I've hurt myself running so hard for that race. I mean, I ran a half marathon in Denver probably four years ago and I spent so much time on the track hitting my numbers. I mean, I was so proud that I hit my numbers. Like, never mind that I limped home, you know, every day, like, limped around the house because I'd thrashed my left hip so much, you know, but that was, I just wanted to hit the numbers. I was so fixated on hitting the numbers that I didn't tune in at all. Um, and so recently, or about two years ago, I took a chi running workshop, um, and I wrote about it for Runner's World, and I um, kind of look at the book every now and then. Um, and I'm not a chi, like, you know, uh, zeal it or anything. Um, but it really forced me to tune into what I was doing. I took off my watch, I t t put away my music, and I just thought about being light and quick, having a little bit of a forward lean, just stuff that worked for me that I needed to do for my running, um, really picking up my cadence. Um, and, and I have not been injured in the two years since. I mean, I did my Ironman, and that was great. I mean, it was more walking than running, but I, I chi walked. Um, but, uh, but I just think, you know, thinking about your form and thinking about just where you are and looking around and just kind of being appreciative that you get to be out here because, you know, as anyone who's been injured knows, you take away your run and it's, things can go south pretty quickly. So if you can kind of appreciate where you are and not get hung up in the distractions, um, it's great. Okay, so, um, so the fifth truth of being a busy runner is that you've got to pick an appropriate goal. Um, and so many runners think, I've got to run a marathon. I've got to go 26.2 or I'm not a real runner, which drives me crazy, by the way, because if you run, you are a runner. Um, and you're not a jogger. By the way, Sarah wanted me to make sure. She wants to banish the word jogging from, from the English vocabulary. So there's her, uh, her plea. Um, but you have to pick a goal that's exciting and interesting to you. Like, if a marathon, if that kind of fills you with dread, then absolutely don't do it. I mean, I ran one marathon in 1997 took a decade off <laughs> and ran another one in 2007. And when I finished that one, I said to Sarah, who I'd run with it, that was the marathon that started Run Like a Mother. I said to Sarah, I'm never going to run another marathon unless it's at the end of an Ironman. Because I always knew that that goal was really interesting and delicious to me. And I, you know, that's another talk, but a marathon at the end of an Ironman is a much different beast than a straight up marathon. It's much it's a lot easier, I think, actually. Um, so, so if you want to do a triathlon, you know, it doesn't have to be an Ironman, but if you're interested in learning how to swim and you don't know how to swim, that's your goal. You can do a duathlon. You can do a trail race. You can do a mud race. You don't have to race. I mean, here we've got, you know, what are you training for is the Training Peaks logo. And you know what? When you're a mother runner, like, life is a very appropriate and suitable answer. And you don't have to always be, you know, just going, 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 and striving, striving, striving. So, um, so yeah, so just pick a goal that feels, it can definitely be challenging and daunting, but it has to be interesting. It's kind of like, I mean, it's almost, I can compare it to writing a book. Like, people always say, if you're going to write a book, you better be really, really interested in that topic because you're going to be so sick of it by the end. So if you say, oh, I, I'm going to train for a marathon, and, I mean, our training plan for um, a marathon and train like a mother, I think, is 20 weeks long. I mean, 20 weeks is a long time to keep your eye on that ball, so you better pretty much really want it, going to want it. Um, and so when you do have a pie-in-the-sky goal that feels a little bit daunting but very exciting, um, I think it's, if you can afford it, um, a coach is so valuable. And I know it can be a stretch, especially when you've got, you know, young kids or kids in college or whatever it is, you're like, wow, that feels really selfish. I shouldn't spend money on somebody telling me to go run. 
but that person is invaluable. Um, Sarah qualified for Boston with a coach. I couldn't have done an Ironman without a coach. Um, and the reason why they're so invaluable is, um, first of all, they keep you accountable. Um, you know, like, kind of like a best running friend, like you're not gonna leave your best running friend in the corner, but you might not get yourself out of bed if she wasn't waiting for you. And meanwhile, if your coach, you know, whether she's virtual or down the block from you, you know, is waiting for your feedback from your five mile today, you know, I'd be like, oh, you know what, I just decided, mm, wasn't gonna do it. You know, like, she's, she's gonna be looking for it and, and, and chances are you're gonna want to, to give it to her. Um, so that is awesome. Um, and then they also just, they're the captain of your boat and you just, everything else that kind of stresses you out when you're training, like, put it on their shoulders. You have to travel, your kid was sick, you, you got sick, um, you're injured. Like, they get to deal with that. They get to figure out a way to get your workouts in without you having to stress about it. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, I mean, I travel a lot for another mother runner and so, you know, hey, I'm going to Albany. All right, well, this is what we're gonna do. And, and you know, I mean, I had to find the pool, but, you know, she made, gave me a workout and I had, you know, it was just, I didn't have to, it just takes the pressure off of everything being your responsibility. Similarly, I mean, since I am at Training Peaks, um, you know, I got my program, my Iron Mother is what I called it, my Iron Mother training program um, through Training Peaks. And um, every morning you get an email that says what your workout is. I mean, I usually checked it the night before because I had to um, kind of plan for the next morning because I was an early morning riser and got it done in the morning. Um, but every morning, the last thing was foam roll. Foam roll, 10 minutes. Foam roll, 10 minutes. Light foam roll, heavy foam roll. Work on your quads, whatever it was. And I hate foam rolling. <laughs> I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. But seeing it, you know, six days a week, um, was perfect. I mean, I didn't do it six days a week, but I did it two or three days a week, which was a lot more than I would have done it had I not had it kind of blasting at me all the time. Similarly, um, you know, a coach will get your strength training in. I mean, that's a big complaint we get from women is how, you know, I'm supposed to get in these miles and then I'm supposed to strength train and then I'm supposed to stretch and then I'm supposed to work on my core. Like, how do I fit it all in? They help you do it. I mean, and my coach, what she did for me is that she pulled back a little bit on my endurance stuff. And so instead of going for, say, like a 60-minute mi ride, I'd go for a 45-minute ride and lose, use the last 15 for strengthening that left hip of mine. And, you know, it makes a big difference. Again, like, she's going to guide you there. So if that's something, you know, if you have a big goal and you're not sure how to get from A to B, you know, ask around and, and talk to a couple coaches and see if they're the, the right person for you. Um, okay, so uh, we're on to our seventh truth. Um, and, uh, and the thing about um, a coach, whether you have it or not, um, is that uh, you're gonna race. And this sounds, <laughs> sounds more, um, I realize that this is kind of a little bit more negative than I wanted it to be, but nobody cares about your finishing time but you. Nobody does. Maybe your coach does, and maybe your husband or your kids, maybe if they're older. But the reality is, is it's not gonna be like on my tombstone, like dimity, like, you know, 413 marathon PR, you know, like nobody cares, you know, because they care if you're a nice person, they care if you're gonna cheer them on, they care um, if you meet your goal, they care if they're gonna, you're gonna take your kid after the race for a play date, you know, they're gonna, they want you to be their friend. And I think people get so hung up on the times and the numbers and it's not like people walk around like, I'm a 215 half marathoner and this is a 155, so I like her more, you know, like that sounds really basic, but I think people sometimes get into that mentality like, faster is better, and it's not necessarily the truth, you know? So um, I think it's just really important that you, that you remember that and, and realize that there are, sometimes there are races that you shouldn't do for time, you know? Like if you're going to the Big Sur Marathon, take your watch off. I mean, Sage Roundtree, who's a yogi and a coach and very good author, you know, she was talking about, she convinced a whole bunch of people to run naked at the Big Sur Marathon because just take it in. Like when do you ever get to run? by Big Sur again, you know, I mean, and she ended up running faster than she expected to. I mean, that's another lesson right there, but, um, but, uh, and even, you know, I mean, Sarah told me to put in this story and I don't know that it's that interesting, but I mean, I had three goals for Ironman. I mean, I had like a really great day, a good day, and I'm gonna finish <laughs> if it kills me kind of day. And um, my great day, I met my great day on, a, uh, on the swim, I met my great day on the bike, and then, like I said, the run pretty much slayed me. And, uh, 
and I wasn't on there. And, um, and, and you can watch online, and my splits were like in the 11s, and then they went up to the 12s. And it's not like Sarah said, oh, I'm done. You know, like, you know, she still wanted to support me. She still wanted me to do the best I could. And um, I just think that it's really important to, to remember that, that it's like the comprehensive picture. It is not, you're so much more than your numbers. And it's so easy to sometimes get lost in that when you get into a race. Um, and you get into a race and you have maybe a bad race, okay? Because it all happens to all of us, you know? Like, I'm hoping Pam, who's sitting here in the audience, has her day at Ironman Lake Tahoe. I'm thinking you will, Pam. You look, you look confident. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, so, um, but if you have a bad race, um, I, again, this goes under, I don't want running to be more of a stress. I don't want it to be stressful. I don't want it to be dreadful. I don't want it to put more pressure on your life than you already have. Um, and so you have a bad race. It didn't go how you planned. Um, give yourself 24 hours to bitch about it. You know, put it up on Facebook, cry, you know, make your husband make you dinner because you had a bad race, whatever it happens to be, and then get over it. Like the world is still turning and you will have another shot at it if you want it. Um, I just think, you know, again, like the less that you can kind of carry around like pressure from running, stress from running, numbers from running, and the more you can kind of zoom out and be like, I get to run and I am taking care of myself and I am feeling better because I get to do this, the better off you'll be. Um, so you have a bad race um, and uh, you know, give yourself 24 hours and then be done. That's all, you get to, that's all you get to complain about it for. If you want, I think this is a helpful exercise and I've done it a couple times, um, is to um, write down a couple things that went wrong. You know, so maybe Chipotle wasn't what you should have eaten the night before and you like had a burrito bomb in your stomach, you know, or maybe, you know, you had the common mistake of going out too fast and you got to the halfway point, you were like, oh my gosh, I'm only at the halfway point, I still have to go, you know, as far as I came and, and I'm already feeling kind of wasted or whatever it happens to be. Um, and uh, and so, so you can look back on that, you know, when you go back at the half marathon, say, in four months, you know, and you come back and like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this different, I'm going to stay at my, you know, the pace that I was supposed to and not get caught up in everyone else and fly and die like, you know, 90% of the people do. Um, but similarly, again, just going back to like, I get to be out here, I'm proud of my effort no matter what it says on the clock, is write down some things that went well. You know, really like find things in every race that went well. And even in any, every run, I mean, if you want to, if you got the time, <laughs> you could do that, you know, if you're journaling, uh, if you're a journaler, you could do that for every run. But, you know, it could be, again, just making out the door. I had an IT band and I got to run pain free. It, um, it could be that um, you picked it up at the end even though you knew you weren't going to meet your goal. Um, it could be that you passed more people than you've ever passed before. You know, I mean, because there is something good in every run and every race. And I just think, again, it's, it's your responsibility to find it. Um, okay, so we're going to zoom back out for the last two. Um, for the, um, the last, this last one is kind of more of a life perspective, but um, just like in kids or infants and people actually, sleep begets sleep, right? Like if your kid has not slept in forever, it's impossible to get them to sleep. And then they wake up 20 minutes later, right? And they're like, dang it, you should have slept for 20 hours, right? And, but a, a well-rested child will sleep for a long time, right? It's the sad truth of motherhood. Um, so self-care begets self-care. And so when we talk about self-care, um, at another mother runner, we're obviously talking about running. Again, that me time, putting yourself first, um, you know, regularly, not all the time, but regularly enough that you feel balanced and optimistic and healthy and good um, so that you can take care of others, you know, because no one else is going to take care of you. And so you've got to take care of yourself so you can take care of the armies of people that depend on you. Um, and so, you know, I know when I go for a run in the morning, like, I am so much more inclined to eat well that day. Like, I don't beeline for the sugar. I don't beeline for the caffeine because I'm not looking for these, like, artificial pick-me-ups that running provides me naturally. So, again, like, that's a little bit of an incentive sometimes even to get me out of bed sometimes. I'm like, okay, Dimity, if you just get up and do three miles, you're going to set yourself up for a much better day than if I lie here for, like, the 40 minutes and drool and be like, you should have gone, you should have gone, you should have gone, right? Right? I'm right, right? We, we've all been there, right? So, um, so, so, you know, self-care begets self-care. You eat better when you run. You sleep better when you run. 
And then you also have to kind of, you know, um, continue that cycle. And, and when Sarah and I were talking about this talk, she was like, well, it sounds a little selfish. And I was like, yeah, but I think that's important. I mean, putting yourself first isn't necessarily selfish, right? I mean, you know, training for three Ironmans in a year, that's selfish, you know? One in a lifetime, not self. No, <laughs> I'm just, uh, just defending myself here. But um, no, but I, um, so, so, you know, like if it's nine o'clock um, and it's your bedtime and you're not going to stay up to watch John Stewart with your husband, that's okay. You know, like you get to do that. You get to take care of yourself. Um, you can't run on grilled cheese crusts or chicken nuggets or whatever you feed your kids and, and go out and pretend like you're going to have a great run. It doesn't work that way. So, you know, if you need to take some time in the day to make some great meals for yourself and put your kids in front of Dora, that's okay. Like, you get to take care of yourself. And I think that that's just really important. Um, and going back to the bedtime thing, I mean, Sarah gives me a lot of, <laughs> a lot of grief for going to bed early. But here's a little, here's a little uh, anecdote about that. I run with a, um, a group of women in my neighborhood, and there's a woman named Emily who's always like, oh, I can't get up at 5.45. I can never get up at 5.45. Dimity, I'm never going to meet you for a run. Um, she's been there for the past three 5.45, um, you know, bugle calls. And, uh, and so I was talking to her, and I was like, Emily, what's going on? She's like, I'm going to bed after I put my kids, go to, after I put my kids to bed. So, you know, she's not, I mean, you know, the, the saying is nothing good happens after midnight. I adjust that for, for my 41-year-old body and say, you know, nothing good happens after 9.30. But, you know, Facebook can wait. The laundry can wait. Like, get to bed because sleep is such a powerful recovery tool and really a powerful motivation tool because when you feel rested in the morning, you can get up and go. Um, and then the last one is kind of our informal motto around another mother runner. It's four words. Uh, it is don't think, just go. Um, and when you are lying in bed and it is so warm and it's dark outside and you're not sure if your friends are going to be there and you're just like, oh, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, get up, don't think, just go. Like, hear me in your head, don't think, just go. I mean, I get that repeated back to me a lot and it works, you know, or you get home and your kid is, you know, your little ankle biter is holding onto your calf, mom, mom, don't, no running, no running, I don't want, you know, no running, and you just feel like, oh, I'm the worst mom ever, and they don't want me to go, and I shouldn't go, I should stay here and do Legos, or whatever it happens to be, get out the door, I promise you within five minutes, your child will be fine, it's like the babysitter drop off, right, they have a problem, and you call five minutes later, and they're like, oh yeah, they're fine, you know, I mean, and that used to happen to me a lot when my kids were younger, you come back in the house, you know, 40 minutes later, they don't even acknowledge me, like let alone, you know, like that, that's the end of it, you know, they're kind of like a dog, they live in the present, so, so don't think that you're scarring them for life if they, you know, give you a guilt trip. Um, I think it's just, um, it's just so important to just, you know, almost just like put your mind on autopilot, have your clothes laying out, especially if you want to go in the morning. I promise you, if you do not have your clothes laying out and you don't have, you're not meeting anybody, that is like, for me, it means I'm not going to go. Like I, I tell Grant, my husband, um, I'm going to go for a run in the morning or I'm going to go for a swim or whatever, but I haven't set myself up to do that. I'm not going. <laughs> I'm laying in bed. So kind of put yourself in a position to succeed. Um, and there you go. Those are my 10 tips for, um, or my 10 truths of running for mother runners. And then we have... Um, recruited a couple questions from people on the internet um, and on our Facebook page, which is Run Like a Mother, colon, the book. Um, and uh, so I'll do the first one, which is um, Shannon and a woman who called herself the mommy asked, um, what does your day look like when you're not training for a race? Or the mommy kind of asked, what do you do in between races? Um, and that's a really hard question because or that's a hard position to be in because um, so many people are goal driven. So it's like race after race after race just to keep themselves getting up and staying on a training plan. And I get that. I totally understand that. Um, for me, I'm, I, I like to race a lot more judiciously I just because I just don't like to race that much. <laughs> I don't want to be in a half marathon every month. If you want to, like more power to you. So, um, you know, so the time between races or if I'm just chilling, I mean, I run three days a week. That's what my body can handle at this point in my life. So, you know, um, I like to try and do like one quote unquote harder workout, which might be a hill repeat. It's usually a hill repeat. I don't really like to do speed unless I'm forced <laughs> to try and pick it up. Um, one day would just be like a five miler, just easy kind of around. And then maybe I try to 
stay in a keep my long run in like the 70 to 80 minutes, which is you know 78 miles usually for me. Um, Sarah likes to go like have at least 10 or 11 miles for her long run every weekend, but that that isn't interesting to me. Um, I think uh, so. I run a couple days a week, um, cross train a little bit. I'm gonna strength train. That's what the, the perpetual promise that we all have, right? I'm going to strength train more, right? Um, that's my plan for this winter. Um, the one thing. Shannon um, and, and another woman asked about this, but I do pretty religiously and have since 2010 is Pilates twice a week. Um, I have some uh, disc problems in my lower back and uh, I went to the doctor and he um, was like, I, I wanted a cortisone shot, I wanted surgery, I wanted something that was like gonna fix it, right? I don't wanna work anymore, I wanna fix it. And he suggested Pilates. Um, and I went, and um, my core has never been stronger. My back pain, I still have it for sure, but it's not the intensity or the regularity that it used to. And I just find myself, I mean, um, I'm pretty tall, and I really need to make sure that I maintain my posture. Um, and it helps me with I'm running. I mean, one of the easiest tips to improve your running is to run tall. Think about standing up straight, run tall. Um, so twice a week I go to Pilates. And then the rest of my day probably <laughs> looks a lot like yours, Janet, I mean, you know, I've got to be home by 7, you know, and then I, my kids are in school from 8 to 3, and then it's the flute lesson, you know, swim team bingo, and, you know, suck down some dinner and get up and <laughs> do it again, right? Um, Freedom wanted to talk about pushing a running stroller and how it changes your running style. Um, and it's been a while since I pushed a stroller, um, but... Uh, I think the biggest thing with pushing a stroller is trying not to change your running form while you're pushing it, which is easier probably said than done. But again, running tall, thinking about being really tall. Um, if you can, if you're um, in a road or a path that feels right and you um, feel safe with it, one hand, so you can kind of keep your other hand, um, keeping your rhythm going, just keep one hand on the stroller. Um, really quick, short steps. Um, and I mean, and just realize that it's like strength training and running built in one. I mean, it's like a hill workout. And if you're going to a hill workout, it's like a hill workout, you know, squared, right? So, um, so I, I mean, I kind of liken it to uh, if, you're, if you've ever been a competitive swimmer, you, know, you wear like two suits for the practices, and then you take that one off to race. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you push your stroller, that's your second suit, and then you go to the race, and you don't have anything. It's like liberation. And you're just like un, un, ungodly fast. So, um, so yeah, so I would just kind of give yourself a lot of mother runner points for running with a stroller and realize it's really going to pay off um, with your speed. Um, two more questions. Erin uh, is training for her first marathon. She's having some piriformis and slight IT band issues. Um, she has four children. Um, and so she also, so in addition to her four children and training for a first marathon, she knows that she needs to do some core work, some physical therapy um, to strengthen her glutes and her hips. Um, and she goes to yoga two times a week. And then she's asking if I thought she should do Pilates. Um, she's just kind of worried about fitting it all in and not sacrificing, you know, all this family time. Um, and what I mentioned before with the bike and, and what a coach will do, I think it's more important to cut a run short, you know, cut a run from six miles to five miles or even to four miles and spend those 10 to 20 minutes strengthening yourself because you can run yourself into the ground and then you're nothing. And then, and then you've got no race and you're really injured. And so you've taken yourself out of running for a long time. So Aaron, if I were you, I would look at your training plan. I would find a couple days a week where it seems like they're shorter, easier runs um, and lop a mile off of them, just a mile. And um, do it outside if you can <laughs> before you get home. Because you get home and if you four kids, I imagine they're younger, you know, they're on you, or you have to empty the dishwasher, you've got to make lunch, or whatever. I mean, so stop at a park, or stop at the end of the street. I mean, you look like a little bit like a freak show doing a plank on the sidewalk, but it's better than not doing it at all. I mean, I do it, right? Uh, I, I've done it. Um, if my neighborhood friends were here, they would be like, yes, you do do it. You make us do it, too. But um, so I would really um, focus on getting to the race happy and healthy. I mean, that's your first marathon. That should be your only goal should be to finish it and finish it injury free with a smile on your face. So whatever you need to do to get there, again, um, make, it, make it happen. And then the last, time, the last one is from Nancy. Uh, she's wondering how do you balance the drive to improve and challenge yourself and not steal all the free time from your spouse 
My husband is active too, and there are times when my running races and training create some tension in the fancy Nancy house, she says. Um, and that's super common um, with two active spouses, obviously. I wrote about this a little bit in Run Like a Mother. My husband is also an endurance athlete. <clears throat> and it used to be that we traded off. Um, you know, he got to do an event, and then I got to do an event. And it went back and forth. Um, and then he kind of like lost the memo on that. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, you're training for the Colorado Marathon while I'm doing the Ironman training? Like, what, what is this? You're not following the rules. But um, as your kids get older, it's a little bit easier to make that work. Um, but all I can say is uh, to sit down and map it out. I mean, um, somebody once just told me recently it's 70% um, of training is showing up, and 30% is guarding the or to guarding the time you've committed to show up. So, um, so you know, I, I, I pick Sunday night because that's like an easy end of the week night, but sit down with your husband, Nancy, and say, I have these four workouts I wanna do this week. When can I fit them in? Or what, or if you wanna be even more like a loving spouse, ask him first what he wants to do, and then say, okay, like, okay, so let's put yours in, and now this is a, how I'm gonna work around you. I mean, it's not super women's Libby, but the, the way, if you can plan your training to have the most minimal effect on those around you, you know, whether it's work, kids, family, your parents, whatever it happens to be, the, the less that it impacts them, the happier you'll be and the easier it'll be. So, you know, if that means getting up early and getting it done, or, you know, if you are at your, um, doing, doing a lunchtime run at work and you just have to, you know, take a quick, bathroom moist towelette shower and get back to your desk with red cheeks like that's okay it's good enough you know like you might smell a little bit but you'll be happier because of it so um so I guess you know for Nancy I would just say you know try to compromise as best you can and then pick pick um races that um that uh, are opposite each other so that you're not not bumping into each other all the time are there any other questions Do you guys have any questions or anything no Awesome. Well, thanks again, Training Peaks. Uh, I hope this was helpful. And um, you can catch us at anothermotherrunner.com. Our Facebook page is Run Like a Mother, the book. Um, this is Run Like a Mother. You can't miss it on the shelf. Um, and this is Train Like a Mother because, you know, you're so tired, you might, you might not be able to find it. So we wanted to make them really bright. Um, they're available on Amazon. And we've also got a really popular podcast um, that's on iTunes called Another Mother Runner. Um, and it's great to listen to to pass some time on the runs when you're tuning out and you're tuning out runs, not you're tuning in runs. <laughs> Thanks.